Um, okay, right. So, um, so we're, we're we're back for the for the second section of the of the interview with Janet from World Anvil. So, um, where where is World Anvil in your sort of development plan now? Have you have you reached a point where it's a you know it's it's sort of the 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 one point or product and and you've got you, you you've got the biggest features you would have wanted in there. Or, uh, oh, sorry. No, but you, you you go ahead. You describe to me because. So um, we just released um, zero point nine five. So it's worth worth mentioning at this point. World Anvil is still in beta. Sure. Uh, we are not at a point where we can say this is kind of done. It needs fixes, but it's kind of done. We're not there yet because there's a there's a lot to do and there's a lot more functionality that would like we would like to see uh the update we've just released 0 0.95 is called heroes it is essentially if there are any rpgers in in your audience they will love this it is a campaign manager for players gms and the audience so it has uh, full campaign functionality that integrates with your homebrew world and then as a player you can manage your character completely and also have a social media experience with your character. So you can be your character right. in a social media realm, which means that you can capture the voice of your character through microblogging, through images. You can think about what your character is doing in the downtime, in the moments between sessions, what their thoughts are, which means that you end up with a much more complete and thought through character than is often the case in RPG campaigns. Uh, in addition, it's got an audience screen, which means that during your live play sessions, the audience can follow along. They can see the hit points. They can see the shared screen. They can see the dice roller. So they can join in with that experience as well. They can see articles if the GM decides to share them. So um, and then, of course, they can follow the characters as well, because as I mentioned, it's a social media style. So they can go and like their comments. They can go and write comments on images that they've shared, all of this kind of stuff. So it, when, when you talk about sharing your live audience, is, is that through other software or is that part of World Anvil? No. That's part of World Anvil. So there is a live script, a live share mm -hmm. screen, yeah. which you can give the audience the URL for, and yeah. they can bring that up, and that will show them a feed of images that the GM has decided to share, or articles, or anything else the GM wants to share. And you can see live the hit points of the character, the character sheets, the expendable slots, um, and you can see the dice roller. So you can you can really keep up with the action in real time. What's going on? Okay, so so it's not so it's not it's not video. Uh, of, of, of the players sitting around playing. No, it's not a video screen. It's like you can see the tabletop while they're playing, essentially. Yeah. That's the easiest way to say it. Yeah, okay. No, no, that, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, and, um, and, that, and that wasn't a feature suggestion, so then... <laughs> no, I mean, we're, we're never going to become Twitch, and we don't no. want to. No. Um, in the same way that we're never no, going to become a virtual you, tabletop. You, I suppose you could, you, you know, and, and I know there are some software packages for directly actually playing the games, uh, you know, playing role playing games uh, uh, over, over the computer rather than face to face. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure it wouldn't be too hard for, for enterprising groups to to either do that or, or stream a video of their session um, in, in, in a separate window. So, um, you know, I mean, that, that that is absolutely fantastic because I think I think five years ago, maybe maybe a bit more, if, if you told people um, one day people will sit around watching other people play computer games and role playing games um, rather than playing them themselves, sometimes right. even with the people they'd otherwise play games with, uh, everybody would have said, well, that, that can't ever possibly make any sense. But it's hugely popular. It's just another form of entertainment. Right. Um, yeah, I, I never thought that you would see tabletop games as a spectator sport, but it's become no, huge. No. And, you know, that's the crowd as well that we want to serve is people who, because because everybody now apparently wants to do a live streamed game. Yes. Um, and so why why are we not helping them? That That's exactly what we wanted to do. So in the campaign update, that's 0 0.95, um, that was something we wanted to do. But of course, that serves, I mean, I was going to say that serves the role players, but we do actually have authors already using this um, this sort of in-character feature yeah. uh, to explore characters and explore character interactions and this kind of thing. Fine. But we are going to do a big writer's update. That's the next thing that's coming. We call, we're calling it Scribes. Yeah. 
Right. Just to keep the theme. So I want to ask about the about Patreon because I'm familiar with it as 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 a way to fund comics and you know art, art creation and, and so on. But I think I've I've seen you say that you can limit access to a world to, to your Patreon subscribers. It's, yep. How how does that work? Is it is it a hard slog as you as you mentioned in the previous segment about when, when you have Patreon subscribers you have to then add them in and and, and sort of register them yourself. Um, how, no. how does it work? It's easy because we made like it easy. easy. <laughs> easy is good right because one of the things we figured so this is part of our sage tier which is our professional offering we figured by the time you've got a patreon you've gone fairly professional so all right it's part of the professional tier um and essentially instead of relying on webhooks the patreon webhooks are not super reliable so we're like okay we don't do webhooks we do it via csv import so what that means is you can purge and then refresh your csv feed and it will automatically update your Patreon list and who has access. Right. And you can do that by subscriber group. So essentially, if you have um, a $5 tier that gets one article a month of world building and a $10 tier that gets access to an article of world building and a short story a month, you have them in different subscriber groups. And then you add, you just refresh the tiers whenever you want to um, with the click of one button and all of a sudden they have access to the things they should have access to. So the beauty of subscriber groups is essentially what you're doing is you're, you're giving limited access. So you have things that are private except for people you have said can see them. Yeah. Now the other functionality that we have for that is um, in the Sage tier, you can now have password protected articles, which means right. even if you don't have, even if your Patreons are not signed in, they can click the article put in the password and see it, but they can only put it in if they have the password, right? right? So that's another way to keep your articles private, except for the people you want to see them. And that would work for beta readers, that would work for editors, that would work for anybody. Right. Um, we've seen people you do this with Twitch subscribers as well. Yeah. Um, and, and people who have a Kofi and people who have a storefront. In fact, we have, um, we have now uh, publishing houses, small publishing houses using World Anvil as um well as as a platform to okay. release their content so they have a web store and once you've paid for the web store you become a subscriber to the thing that you have bought which is uh for them they're an rpg publishing house so that's going to be integrated adventures yes um which integrate with the wiki of the world as well so it if everything integrating together maps that are clickable it will give you access to extra map layers that give you the dms information that you need to run the campaign like here is the dungeon here is where your players will start um here are the kinds of things you can expect to see here is the hot point for this monster because you can draw polygons on the map right so you can be like and this is where this hangs out and this is where this hangs out and this is the journey that they took um and you can do it all fully integrated on world Humble. So for authors, what that means is that if you're doing, you know, if you're doing flash fiction exercises, you can release those to your Patreons on World Anvil. If you're doing uh, short stories between uh, novel releases, which, you know, everybody does these days, particularly if you're doing a longer form novel, like uh, epic fantasy, for example, especially, everyone releases short stories between the novels because it, it takes a minute or two to get them written. Uh, but it also means that if you're writing world building articles anyway to build up your world, you can then release those as content if you want to for your Patreons. So they can get behind the scenes looks yeah. and uh, they're not then released to the public. So it's a great way to reward people who support you, reward people who read or buy your books or anything else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know quite a few people who, um, uh, in the authors who uh, have successful Patreon um, accounts and they're usually, uh, they're usually handing out um, uh, short fiction and, and so on um, and there are some people who who use it for uh, non-fiction purposes so they will do extra Q&A uh, videos and, and that sort of thing um, can you on, on, on a world angle page can you can you do something like embed a YouTube video and link, uh, and link to a YouTube video I'm not yep sure or a SoundCloud video or a SoundCloud uh a uh, URL or a Spotify URL or a Podbean URL or a Libsyn URL, which means actually that if you want to um, give your patrons a short story yeah. and then read it out to them, yeah. 
read it in the author's voice, for example, yeah. which people I, There are loads of people who would. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it's, it's, Neil Gaiman reading Neil Gaiman. These, these yeah. are audio books that sell. This is, this is what people want. They want to hear, because authorial, authorial intent is important to the people who are interested in the author, right? Yeah. You can argue night and day whether it's important, you know, from a sub from an objective point of view. But by the time people are supporting an author on Patreon, they are interested in the authorial voice. They are interested in the writing and the stuff behind the writing. Yes. So, so why not? Yeah, and I, I, I think it's it's ideal for something like a short story as well because um, you know mo most authors aren't and never will be a performer in the way that, that Neil Gaiman is. Um, and, and, and aren't going to be comfortable. And I, I, I'm a massive audiobook consumer, and I want an actor to read the audiobook. I don't, most of my friends who are authors, sorry guys, I, I don't want to hear you read your audiobook. Right. But, but as an engagement thing, um, if I, you know, if you like going to a bookshop and seeing somebody read a chapter of their book or, or a scene from their book, um, the performance, as long as they make an effort, isn't, isn't, the, isn't the thing. I don't, they don't need to be able to do all the accents particularly well um, but you know reading out a short story is is, is doable um, and and the production quality just needs to be audible whereas if if you you know if you have the slight, the slight crackliness of having done it at home that, 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 that you will get um, that's not really going to be any good on a on, on an audio um, book you're selling on audio Oh yeah, I'm, I don't suggest but, but authors video. necessarily do their own audiobooks, but definitely as a Patreon reward, it's it's yeah, nice. No, it's, you know, it's nice. It's right. touching to hear authors read their work. Yeah, yeah and, and and then you can discuss it as well afterwards and right. and say, you know, if you've got a literature teacher looking at this, they've probably got it wrong. I just meant this. You know? <laughs> right. Exactly. I've always thought if I ever wrote anything that that, that became of note, I I put up public messages of of if your literature teacher teacher. 500 years from now tells you that I meant this. No, I just meant this. <laughs> so anything they tell you that, that they're reading in that I didn't put in there, it's not in there, you know? So. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. Um, there's a famous story that, about Asimov being at a party and, and encountering a couple of people arguing over a book. Um, and one of them says it means this, and the other says it means this, and he goes up and says it doesn't mean either of those things, it means this, and they say, you know, well, what do you know about it? And he says, I'm Isaac Asimov and I wrote it. Right. And of course, exactly. you expect the story to sort of end with, and then they went, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll concede, our, concede your point is valid, and of course they didn't. Um, so hence, <laughs> hence, it probably stuck with him a lot more than it otherwise would have, you know, they were like, but, but, but your story really means this, and you think, that's a special kind of arrogance. <laughs> right, exactly. That's a special kind of special right there. Like, like, if, they, if they'd been saying, it's very effective because you, you tapped into this emotion, you might expect the author to go, oh, I never looked at it that way. I just sort of wrote it and it works because humans tend to have an innate, innate sense of story because it's how we describe everything in our life. Right. So it, it, it's quite possible to, for your brain to understand story structure better than you do. Um, you know, so so studying it can be quite revealing because then you can do things that you would you would write naturally. You can do them deliberately. Um, so it's you know it, right. You can understand why you felt like this character had to be like this, or why you felt yes. that should be yeah. there, and then you can understand. Yeah, I mean, I have. Um, give me one second. Yeah, that's okay. This is my bible for that. Yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, I love this book so much. I mean, it's it's horribly sexist in the third part, but um, apart from that, it's it's amazing, and it has been very very useful for me. Yes. Um, and again, this was this was a massive revelation for me when I was looking over plots that I I'd, I'd worked on, and then I I sort of went back to them. I was like, huh, that's why that character had to die there, and that's why that had to work like this. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. There's a there's a common thing you'll 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 sort of hear from from new writers who who think my work has to be original. And the answer to that is there's nothing original. It's just a different order of words. You're, you're not really, I mean, yes, it's original, but at the same time, it's, it's not original. Um, it's, it's like saying your chocolate cake is going to be unique. Well, yes, technically it will be, but. Um, right. Chemically, yes, but, but, but you know, structurally, no. Yeah, um, yeah, and actually you want to pray that your chocolate cake is not too unique because yes. things can go wrong. I mean, I'm just going to say this once. Yeah. 
you know, the last season of Game of Thrones was trying so hard to defy expectations. Yeah. But it, you, many felt it didn't work, and I was among them. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not a I'm I'm not a fan. I I I confess I I watch it by watching videos about Arya and Tyrion, mm -hmm. and that's about it. You know, I just fair enough. I I could never get into it, and um, I you know I'd read the books before the series came out. Sure. Uh, and so now I will catch up when he finishes the books and then I will watch the series and, and, and see what the difference is. But um, I, I, can, I can absolutely understand why people felt that, that they really needed a few more hours to just, um, to just wrap up some of the storylines and, and expand on them a little bit to explain what was going on. I've, right, I've, but I've heard somebody describe it as sort of, I can fill it in in my head because I know the form but I really wanted to see somebody on the cat on the screen say, "But why are we doing this?" Right. They answer it um, because it's because it's what they've come to expect. Sure, but I mean, in my in my opinion, it was trying so hard to subvert expectations. It was trying so hard not to put somebody you thought on the throne. It's yeah. trying so hard not to give people storybook endings. Which okay, it's yeah. it's grim dark fantasy. I get that, but at the same time, what it made is a very unsatisfying conclusion. Yes, for a lot yes. of people and you saw these people sort of spin off and continue to live their lives rather than come to any kind of even temporary hiatus i'm i'm honestly a little bit surprised that that they didn't just do shoot alternate endings and say yeah. here's, here's your choose your own this is the official version based choose on your own adventure here's here's three different versions there is a there's a limited edition you can get where or, well you know or a an extended edition you can get where where this character becomes the the king and and it's all explained and you know some of the scenes remains you know and george R. R. martin could do that with a, with a series like that and it and it made me think well if i get around to writing my main fantasy series at some point then then maybe maybe i'll <laughs> maybe i'll do that as a as a what if ending i know marvel have done things like that they've done what if versions of if if their if their universe deviated at a certain point what what would sure. some stories do um and it might sound a bit a bit mad to people who aren't familiar with comics but people love it they love to see what um one of my favorite superman ones was red sun where he lands in russia not america and he grows up under the yoke of stalin not like mm -hmm. as stalin's like pet superhero um and, and that's very different <laughs> um but his his innate goodness shines through um, just, you know, despite the upbringing, so it's it's a fascinating ultimate take.